over those mountains is Syria. And this is one of the camps we saw. It's a tent camp. It hosts more than a thousand people. This is a, the district governor showing me around. The camp is filled with children. About half of all Syrian refugees are children. The tents are actually have been reinforced for winter. They have heating inside. You will see it in a second. And the conditions are acceptable. This is a, a woman who's saying that children are being killed in Syria, people are being beaten up. When her husband, who's right there, went to demonstrations against the authorities, they wanted to arrest him. So they've been there for two and a half years in this camp. They're grateful, but their life is very difficult. They have to care for the children in the tent. They're doing everything in the tent, it's quite exhausting, and they're quite tired. So they have electric heaters, they have electricity. And I will talk a, a bit about the services that the Turkish authorities are providing. She's saying that we get enough to eat, but sometimes the water could be of better quality because our children sometimes get sick. This is a, a young boy who says his father, his mother, and all of his uncles are still in Syria, and he wants to go back. He is living with his grandparents. This is a, a different camp, an old tobacco warehouse in which the refugees live several to a room. So I wanted to come here to see, to, to meet with you, to hear your stories, and so that I could try to convince governments elsewhere in Europe to do more. I see my task as uh, ringing the alarm bell and urging countries to do more, shaming them to do more, because Turkey, uh, I think, sets an example uh, for all the rest of Europe as to how it should open up its arms to Syrian refugees. This is Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. And this is one of several refugee reception centers. It's a dilapidated old school that was just opened up. It has about 800 people. The capacity, if you could call it that, is maybe 400 people. This is a gym. You see the basketball court right there. They've been given some blankets, some pieces of wood, and they are living several in each of one of these little spaces. The conditions there are quite bad. Okay. This is all food provided by NGOs. The government is not providing the people in this facility with any food. There's a father saying he can barely take it as a father. My children don't go to school. They're wasting their time. They're growing up here, becoming bigger and bigger, and this is ruining their life. And that depresses me because it's not in my hands. I can't do anything to help them. We came here because we heard that a life counts for something in the European Union. This woman is saying, my child is seriously ill, nobody's supporting us, 
nobody cares about our situation. When I got up this morning, I realized how bad it is and I, and I really feel like killing myself. The gentleman showing me around is the commandant of the facility. He's the only Bulgarian staff member working there in a facility of 850 people. <laughs> our destiny we don't know, sir, yes? yes? That's why we want to know our destiny. You will see that our situation is not so comfortable for us. Now in this room you have just one toilet, it's not enough for what? Mm -hmm. 70 people mm -hmm. here. If you have a family, it will be a disaster for you. You cannot help them. Yes. We make this trip and this journey, even there are war, but we made it for the children, yeah, for, sure, us, sure. for the future of children. Sure. This is the Bulgarian Red Cross arriving to distribute food and blankets and so on. This is in Germany now, arriving in Friedland, the adaptation center. This is the director of the center. It's a facility that's existed for more than 65 years and all new arrivals spend two weeks there learning about Germany, having some lessons in German and receiving information about their subsequent lives after they are distributed throughout the lander in Germany. That's the eating hall. We met with several Syrian families there. December, so nine, nine months you were... Two, two, they arrived two weeks ago. She's saying, we left Syria, we were detained in Bulgaria for five months. We applied for asylum there because there was no other way to get out of detention and then we came to Germany. She said, I don't know anything about Bulgarian laws, but if I have to break the law to give a better life for my children, I will do it. My first conclusion is that most of the Council of Europe member states are in denial about the proportion of the crisis and their own responsibilities to help uh, Syrian refugees and to help their co-member in the Council of Europe, Turkey. My recommendations are that resettlement should be increased. The numbers thus far are quite small. Uh, the second is that obstacles to reaching European territory uh, should be removed. Pushback should stop. Returns to neighboring countries should stop, especially returns to countries with non-functioning asylum systems. I already mentioned Bulgaria, but Greece is in this category as well. Uh, there should be clear search and rescue procedures in the Mediterranean. Uh, migration in general should not be considered a criminal offense. You have a number of countries that criminalize ir irregular entry and put people in detention. Humanitarian visa should be provided and access to asylum within Europe. Uh, they should be treated as refugees when they manage to arrive. This means having functioning fair procedures. This means that countries that see themselves as countries of transit have to begin thinking uh, in a different manner. Family reunification should be facilitated by enlarging the definition of family to non-core members. And money. Countries must continue to donate money to the region, to Turkey, and focus not just on uh, kind of the humanitarian, but also the development dimension. This crisis will not go away. Um, and it's time that we opened our eyes uh, and helped Syrians uh, fleeing the conflict there.